Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine, and this is your Critique of the Week for Friday, September 27th. Uh, as always, do turn your phone sideways and click on full screen and uh, so you can read along as we go. I'm going to leave a test comment really quick to see if the comments are working. Um, they don't pop up until I leave a comment for some reason now. Hi, Stacey O'Connell. Hi, Kim Tidro. Yeah, so for this critique of the week, I could not find Anna McEnulty, um, which has happened a few times in the past, but this time, you know, it, usually when that happens and I can't track down the poet who uh, won the drawing, because sometimes people enter the drawing and then kind of disappear and aren't following our page and stuff like that. In the past when that's happened, I've, um, I've filled in with somebody who, um, you know, was farther down on our list on our drawing. And, um, but, uh, it's a really busy week and I didn't get a chance to do that. So instead I thought what we would do is, uh, I'd tell you a little bit of a point that I always want to make and, uh, using my, one of my own poems, and then we'll have a Q and A. So I'll just ask, answer any questions that you have. Um, but first, so I'm teaching, um, a, a workshop this weekend is the Wrightwood Literary Festival, and I'm doing a workshop on lyrical hiking. Um, which I don't even know what that means, but, uh, but it's just fun to kind of do. So we're going on a hike. We're learning about all nature and we're turning that into a lyric poem. And I thought I have, I have a bunch of poems that I wrote while hiking. Uh, and one of them is called hiking alone for my book. I'll put it on the screen. This is my book, uh, from Red Hen Press, American Fractal, which is about 10 years old now. And I had this poem in here called hiking alone, which, um, I, I was reading it thinking about I might share it as part of this workshop. I have a bunch of nature poems and hiking poems and stuff that we're going to talk about. And I started reading it, and I, it really annoyed the hell out of me. And I don't know. I mean, in, you know, 12 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever I wrote this poem, um, it kind of makes sense that you don't like it in the same way as you used to. But I want to talk about what I don't like about it just really quickly. And it, but, but I'm, I'm going to do a Q&A, so if you have any questions about uh about poetry or publishing or anything you'd like to know that you've always wanted to ask here's your chance so do it now um so one of the things i always talk about uh sometimes you see me talking about them in interviews with poets and stuff is what this reading submissions process is like and to me it feels like i am just listening for authenticity and that's it um there's a way that that when people are being honest and authentic it rings true like a sound of a bell you know, there's that deep note of some kind of emotion that's truth. And um, it really feels like you can just hear that. Like I always say that reading submissions feels like flipping through one of those old fashioned radios and, you know, it's static, 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 and then bam, there's a music station for a little second and then static, static as you flip through. You can really hear that honesty and authenticity. And so I was reading this poem, Hiking Alone, and um, like I said, it annoyed the hell out of me. Um, one of the things that I think the best book about, uh, about writing is actually Zen and the Art of Archery. I don't know who here has read that. Um, I should have grabbed the copy off my shelf. But, um, but it's about archery in theory. But I think it's really about finding that true voice and, and working from a place of honesty. And I think you could tr you know, change the word archery into um, uh, writing or poetry and then, you know, just do a find and replace. And that would be the best book ever written about the writing process. And there's two, a couple quotes that I love from that book. So I'll, I'll read them here. Um, the right art is purposeless, aimless. The more obstinately you try to learn how to shoot the arrow for the sake of hitting the goal, the less you will succeed in the one, and the further the other will recede. What stands in your way is that you have a much too willful will. You think what you do not do yourself does not happen. And so I think when you're writing, we really want to avoid that too much willful will. That's the main thing. I hear too much willful will all the time in otherwise good poems. And that's the writer trying to be a writer rather than let the art create itself. And then the other one I really like a lot from that same book is, um, you must hold the, draw the drawn bowstring like a child holding a proffered finger. It grips it so firmly that one marvels at the strength of the tiny fist. And when it lets the finger go, there is not the slightest jerk. Do you know why? Because a child does not think 
I will now let go of the finger in order to grasp this other thing. Completely, unselfconsciously, without purpose, it turns from one to the other, and we would say that it was playing with the things were it not completely true that the things were playing with a child. And so that sense of, of the poem playing with you, rather than you playing with the poem, is um, really the heart of what the creative process is all about. So, so really quick, I'm going to look at this poem, and then I'm just going to open it up to a QA. and a But... Um, here, this is Hiking Alone. And instead of reading it all the way through, I'm just going to point out the places that annoy me, where I have too much willful will. And they keep popping up over and over again. So here. I shimmy out on sandstone and slate rock, past the soft ledges where the last shrubs grow. So I would say, you know, that's a good opening if I was doing a critique of the week right now. Uh, it sets the scene, and you kind of feel it. I've got my camera unshuttered and silent. Like, what the hell is that? What am I doing? No. <laughs> Uh, ready to take back with me whatever I've come here for. Sore arms and a sunburn. Blue sky like something new. Eh. At the floor of the canyon far below, a stream flows from nowhere to nothing, from one unseen cavern to the next. So here I'm just describing the scene. And then I'm back in the, in the true voice. But here, this stuff is just, it's just a writer trying to be a writer, and that's crap. Uh, I could think of a fish gazing up at that quick flash of sky as it passes through the white froth of the rapids, the silky silver where the water pools. Oh, I am gray, I could, have, I could have him say, personified, moved even, full of emotion. Oh, my scales are golden green. I could give him color just as easily in the kind god of my imagination before plunging him back into his comfortable dark, this islet the only opening for miles. How easy it is to paint epiphany, I think, like the gaudy sunset now settling above the tree line I could call a bruise or a blush. So here I get into this, this crap again. Crap, don't do this. I just want to edit my whole book. Uh, scattering of dust into low light, what one shakes from a shoe, combs out of stiffened hair. So there's good ideas there, but I'm really forcing it. Can you tell the difference between where I'm just telling the story and let it come out naturally and where I'm trying to be a poet? Uh, shut up, Tim. Okay. How easy, too, it would be to slip off this ledge, to get out, lost out here, fall asleep on this rock, and let the cold night wake me. I could hold out on figs and fresh water. I could chew the fibrous bark off a Joshua tree. That's not a crappy line. I could love the moon like a mountain lion. <laughs> uh, stock shadows, sharpened sticks. Uh, come morning, I'd find the dirt road and then my car at the end of it. Now I get back into the store again. I'm just telling it, not trying to be a poet. And see how much better it feels. Brush the dust off my pants. Buckle myself back into habit. Like, that's a little bit of a poetic flair, maybe, back into habit like that. But it, it's in the stream enough that it's fine. With a metal click, the sound of my one hand clapping for joy, however briefly, all we ever wanted, a little darkness to climb out of. So if I were rewriting this poem, I would cut, like, big chunks of it. And I'd be much happier with myself. And it's all about that sense of too much willful will. You think that what you do not do yourself will not happen. And when you're writing poems, you have to let the poem happen and not try to force it as a writer. And so that's one point I always want to make, but I don't want to rip apart other people's poems too much. So I thought I'd rip apart my own a little bit. Um, uh, so that's all I have for today. If, unless anybody has any questions, let me see. Um, let's see. Did maybe questions or comments just about poetry in general? Um, on, our, uh, on one of the threads, somebody asked about... Um, Formal poetry. Let me see if I can find it. Was it Hugh? Hugh Blanton asked and noticed that there are more formal poems in um, the current issue of Rattle, and that seems like a trend elsewhere. And he was asking if that if that is a trend or if that's a conscious decision or what's going on with that. And um, um, as far as that goes, I think what happened. I think there's a long momentum that happens about ideas, and for a long time when I was taking poetry classes back in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of teachers said, don't write in form. A lot of journals said, don't send rhyming poems. Like, we don't want your rhyming poems. And it really gave this impression that rhyming poetry was terrible and you shouldn't do it. And it's something like amateurs do and, and modern poetry doesn't rhyme. And I think that mindset is just gone. And I'm so thankful for that because I love formal poetry. If you look at my book, um, American Fractal, um, like half the poems are formal there's sonnets and there's um, a bunch of other forms in there. So um, so I love formal poetry. I think I've said before on this uh, Critique of the Week workshop that I think formal poetry clicks and is memorable in a way that's hard to do with uh, free verse. And so there are a lot of benefits to writing in form. You know, there's some, there's some 
certain kinds of poems, more narrative poems or more static poems maybe, uh, work better in a free verse than form sometimes um, because they feel a little more organic and like you don't know where you're going or something. So it's a trade-off. There's like a, there's like a, a purity and a perfection to form that feels really good and makes it really, really memorable that I love a lot. But then there's a, the freedom to free verse is great too. So I love all kinds of poems. And it seems to me that, that formal poetry is making a comeback just because I think people aren't teaching that it's a terrible thing anymore. Because I, I don't really hear that in the same way that I did like 20 years ago, that you shouldn't write, write in rhyme and meter. Um, so I think that's just kind of a course correction. Like there was an over adjustment and now it's coming back a little bit. And I, I do see a lot more uh, formal poetry within our submissions. And um, I, I don't know, I always try to find more. I, I really want to publish eclectic issues with a lot of different variety of styles and themes and subjects. I want every page to be a surprise. That's my goal as we're putting an issue together. So I want there to be free verse poems, and then you turn the page and it's a sonnet, and then you turn the page and it's a long free verse narrative, and then you turn the page and it's a little lyric poem, you know? So that's my goal, and, and we always have, you know, we, we never have enough formal poetry, so I'm always looking for that. Um, and... You know, I, I'd like to publish like a quarter of each issue in, in meter and rhyme or blank verse or something. And we really, it's about 5% of submissions instead of 25. So if you want to get in rattle, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to write formal poems because that's one of the things I'm always trying to balance out. Let's see, does anybody else have any questions? Uh, Mark A. Griner says, do you think formal poems provide a useful dividend helping to control the effectness, effectiveness of the writing? I think writing in form, we talked about this if you watched um, the Rattlecast episode um, with Alexander Umless a couple weeks ago. We talked about a little bit about the way that when you write in form, it allows, it, it sort of narrows your, I think there's a, um, what's it called? The um, paralysis of choice. Is that the psychological word? Where there's a sense that you have too many options. Like if you have 50 um varieties of soda to choose from, then, um, you know, it's too many options and you can't enjoy your choice because you're kind of wondering what else could have been. And you're kind of overwhelmed by that sense of variety. Like there's too many options. And there's a way that writing in, um, that's just my dog scratching himself. He, uh, I left him in again, but there's a way that, um, writing form limits your options to certain ways and words and phrases and sounds that fit, which narrows the scope and lets you focus in a way that allows you to leap forward and make surprising connections that you wouldn't have otherwise. So I've heard a lot of people say that once they start writing poems in formal verse, that uh, it's hard to write free verse after that because you feel like that sort of, um, that sense that there are too many options, there's too many places to go and you can't focus. And Alex uh, from that podcast uh, a couple weeks ago said that she sometimes writes in form first and then rewrites it in free verse um, because of that, that situation. Um, um, so yeah, so, so that, I think that answers Mark's question. Um, let's see. Paradox of choice. That's the word. Thanks so much, Jessica Dawson. Paradox of choice it is. Um, does anybody else have any other questions, um, about publishing? I, I was looking at, on the Rattlecast this week, I think it was, uh, a bunch of people were talking about how long it takes to get published, um, and someone was saying that it take, took them 11 years to before they had their first publication, which is pretty impressive that you know to stick with it that long. Um, I don't think there's any any rule about that though. Um, you know, I don't think there's any set amount of time if you put in the work, you end up being published. Then I know some people, somebody who I was talking to recently hadn't really started writing. Um, until just a year ago. And we already had a poem in Rattle. I can't remember who that was though. Um, anyway, does anybody else have any other questions? Cause I have to do, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm all sweaty from lugging boxes around getting the uh, Wrightwood Literary Festival set up. We have a whole bunch of speakers coming in, a bunch of workshops, tables full of books to give away. Um, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So I will go and do that unless anybody has any Q and A kind of questions. Let me skim through and make sure I didn't miss anybody. Um, ah, Jamie Mara says, I would like to know how to avoid overwriting the last line. Should the last line reflect the leap discovery moment of the poem? Is it stronger to end on an image? Thank you. I love these videos. Well, thanks, Jamie. Um, um, I think that, I think you should not worry about 
anything um, about overwriting until you've already written it. And then that's that's a good. I don't I don't really believe much in editing, uh, which is strange because we do a critique of the week every week. But I think that that there's sort of a creative moment that that happens when you're writing and you sort of enter a special space and it's really hard to recreate that same space. So I'm not a big fan of editing in general. Um, but that is one point where I think, um, editing come in is cutting things out that like I was doing with this poem here, cutting things out that, that were forced and weren't working or were overwritten because it's kind of something you, you kind of have to let yourself do that, but then you have to let yourself let that stuff go. So I would, my advice would just be to let yourself overwrite the lines, but then cut the last lines very often when they don't work and, and the poem sooner. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there's a whole there's a, there's a million ways to write a poem, and you can write it with a strong um, ending on an image like that that sort of sticks with you. Or there's a way to do it understated. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways. There's a, there's sort of surprise endings, and there's like clicking endings that sort of have everything fall together. And there's um, I don't know. There's just all sorts of ways to do it. And what you really have to do is be honest with yourself, read what you've written, and realize where it works and where it doesn't. Let's see. Um, let's see. Cassianus Sink says, does the title come before or after for you? Um, the title comes after for me usually. How I usually write is um, I let things kind of flow out, and I don't even do line breaks. I don't worry about anything like that. Um, and I let it, let it, I write it as like a big block of text. Um, it, dep it depends what I'm writing, though. But but most often, I write it as like a big block of text, just letting the flow of... Because you, what you're trying to tap into that, the right hemisphere of your brain, that's the nonverbal associative part that, that knows things that you don't or knows things that you can't access. So you really have to let... Find a way, and everybody's different, but you have to find a way to access that creative part of your brain that is nonverbal. And so for me, I like to try to let just the writing flow and not pay too much attention to what I'm saying until after the fact. And then, you know, I don't consider it revision after the fact because um, it's sort of part of the process. So once I have a big block of text, then I'll carve it and shape it and move things around and sort of make it feel a certain way. And usually I add the title at the very end, um, you know, seeing what, what's there, what needs to be. We've talked in these videos a lot about how um, it's really important to have a poem situated so you know your place within it. You know the, the who, what, why, where, and when questions so you don't feel lost as you're as you're reading as a reader so a lot of times if you write the poem first you can see what you haven't really introduced and where you need help that way and the title is just kind of a way to help you out um, by adding like the the why question or the what question or the where question that um, you hadn't included at the beginning of the poem so then people can uh, um, feel like they're connected to it without having to search um let me see And so Jessica Dawson to that question says, uh, sometimes you get a nifty title first and it builds the poem that comes. I almost prefer it that way. It's like a mystery prize at the end. Yeah, I think I do that. For me, I do that with the first line. But I think you can do anything. You know, a lot of times a poem for me starts with just a phrase that either pops in my head or I overhear that resonates with me for some reason, like a sort of a problem. Like, why is this interesting to me? Or why does it sound so clever? Or what is going on with this phrase? And then the poem is really like, like a bloodhound hunting out for the, the reason or the source of the meaning of that little phrase. And so, um, so for me, it's the first line is usually that. The first line is something that kind of came to me. And then, and then the poem is like a projection of that, like the momentum of that line carrying itself out. But I think you could do the same thing with a title. Um, so I think that would definitely work. And, and there, I think there has to be a mystery in a poem. There has to be something you don't know uh, in order to um, you know, have something to search for. Because then you learn and we learn at the same time as readers, and that's what poetry is really all about. It's sort of a, a um, you know, a non-rational problem-solving device or something, or you know. So, let's see. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any other questions. Thanks so much for the people who did ask questions. Let's see. Let's see. Um, Mark A. Spicknell says, what is the essence, the core characteristic of a sonnet in your view? Um, I don't really, I think a sonnet is just a form, so I don't think it has an essence. 
I think, um, you know, every poem needs to, to have to be a kind of a doorway or like a ladder or like a window or some kind of way where you start in one space and move to another. And a sonnet formalizes that process in a way where the, there's a turn in a lot of the sonnet forms, like a Petrarchan sonnet. Um, uh, but I think every poem sort of does that anyway. So I don't think there is an essence in that respect. Um, I just think it's sort of a formalization of that process. And uh, so otherwise, it's just a 14 line poem with a rhyme scheme that, that fits a sonnet and you call it a sonnet. So I don't think there really is an essence. Uh, Jamie Mara asks, could you talk more about the discovery moment of the poem making the leap? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, I think as you're writing, there's a time where you surprise yourself and you um, realize what you were writing about the whole time. And you have to sort of let that happen on its own. That you know you can't have that too much willful will that I talked about at the very beginning. You know the creative process is something that sort of happens outside of you, because you are sort of your your um, your frontal lobe on the left hemisphere. Like you're very this you know what you think of as you, your consciousness is a very small like part of your brain. But there's all this other uh, neural infrastructure that's running and making the decisions and and thinking about things and coming to conclusions and, and understanding relationships that your, your rational, you know, the voice in your head doesn't have access to. And so when you're writing a poem, you're finding a way to find that, you know, to make those connections, um, to give them words so that your rational part of your brain that you think of as me understands them. And so what you have to do is you have to find a way to let yourself go until you're surprised. And then that's the discovery. And if you find, and I think every writer has their own technique of letting themselves go and finding a way to um, to access that sort of meditative uh, notan, that not me, that sense of like pratisisamapada in in the in Buddhism, that that sense of total interconnectedness with the world, and the way that your yourself kind of fades away. And um, there's a you know every every writer has their own sort of rituals and habits and techniques to get into that and I th nobody really teaches it so there's no real way I think every writer discovers for themselves how to do that but once you you're in that space of creativity which is maybe like walking the border between order and chaos is one way you could say like your your conscious brain is like the the order the yin and the chaos is the yang and you should have one foot in both rivers so you can you can become a vessel that communicates from the chaos to the order or something like that so um so, so as long as you're entering that space, you'll be surprised at yourself automatically almost if you're in that space long enough. So you just kind of have to find a way to get in there and then wait, I think. And that's, that's my opinion about it anyway, having thought about it for, uh, for decades now. Let me see if there are any other questions. Hmm... Let's see, Cam Wheeler says, can you say more about line breaks and how they relate to the continuum of prose and poetry you mentioned last week? Um, so, so I think last week I said, I think line breaks are sort of like the pace car for the poem. They, they set the, the pace of the reading. So if the lines are short, you end up reading slower because your eye has to scan back and it makes the words more prominent too on the page. So you end up focusing more on the language and... Um, um, and, and if they're longer, you focus less on the words and the sounds and the music of those words and more on the story that's being told and the images. I think there's, there's two places. Uh, Cam asked about the difference between poetry and prose. And I think prose uh, lives in the mind's eye. Like it's the, it's the movie you're playing in your head as you're reading like a piece of fiction or, a, or creative writing of any kind or, you know, an essay you know, the ideas or the images or the, you know, the, the, the thing you see that when you, when the world that you're living in, the real world sort of fades away and you enter a book or a, an essay or a, a story and you see in your head what's going on, I think that's what prose does. And that's the sort of the medium of prose. And the medium of poetry is the body because it's, it's, um, the poet is regulating your breath as a reader. And, so, so it's the breath itself, and it's the reader's breath. It's not even the poet's breath. And so shorter lines end up being more poetry because you, you hear the sounds and you shape the words and you can regulate the breathing much more closely than if you have a long, prosious, you know, prosaic stanza, um, which fades back into that mind's eye instead of 
in the body. So it kind of goes from the, the body into the brain. And I think that's the continuum between poetry and prose. And, there, and it doesn't mean one's any better than the other. Both have, you know, both are very functional and uh, work really well for different things. But, um, but that's the continuum we're all working with when we work on poetry. And, and all poetry, con or prose contains poetry, and all poetry contains prose. You know, so it, it all depends on how, um, um, I don't know, it depends on what you want to do and what your goals are. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Brian Larissa Thames Haynes says, Tim, are you a lone writer or is sharing with a trusted others part of your process? Yeah, I'm a total lone writer. And actually, it's kind of funny. People are asking me writing questions because I don't write all that much anymore. Maybe like once a month I get time to write something and I don't even show it to anybody. So I have a whole bunch of poems that nobody's even seen. I used to... Um, I used to read sometimes at the uh, at our at our open mic at our reading series. I would read a poem, but then it kept happening over and over again that there were just more people than there was space, and I didn't want to take up space, so I stopped even doing that. So I just like throw poems in a drawer, and I don't even look at them. I don't even know what I have because I kind of I, I like I, I I became you know I got into poetry because I like the meditative um, state that writing creates and that poetry does. So I just do it as a kind of like meditation. And, uh, and I wish I, I should do it like every day back, but before I had kids and before I worked 60 hours a week, I did that every night and uh, I love that. And that's what I love about poetry. I don't really care about sharing or publishing books or anything like that personally. Um, so no, I don't have, um, yeah, I don't have a trusted other. I don't, I don't show it to anybody. Um, let's see. Brent Stauffer said, how much should a poet keep his audience in mind? I was thinking about that because somebody, where was it? Somewhere on like Facebook or Twitter, somebody had a quote about um, you shouldn't write for your audience, but uh, but don't expect your audience to care if you don't or something like that. And, um, and and so I was thinking about that a little bit just the other day. And I think you have to write for yourself, and then and then hopefully an audience will will appreciate it. So I don't think you should keep the audience in mind because what we love, really, what we love when we read poetry is the idiosyncrasies of an individual human being, I think. And if you're trying to write toward your audience, I don't think those idios idiosyncrasies um, of you as a, as, a, as a writer, as a voice, come out as much. And so I think you kind of have to do your own thing, but recognize, you know, you, you have to, still have to negotiate where it's landing and, and what's working and sort of focus on your own thing where your own thing works. And... Um, and then otherwise, just sort of let the chips fall where they may. That's, that's my opinion. Um, other people, though, completely disagree and, and think that you should write for an audience because why else would you write? And uh, that makes sense, too. So uh, let's see. Kashiana Singh says, what do you think about shape poetry? Have you had an outstanding example come over? Yeah, we've published a few. I'm not a huge fan um, of, of concrete poetry is what I would call it. Um, we had a really cool um, um, sonnet shaped like a coffee cup and a saucer. So the the so the little little two um, the end rind couplet was like the cup of the saucer or the not the cup the dish of the the saucer, and um, and the the turn happened right at that like narrowest point too where the cup and the saucer meet. So it was like a sudden turn into the couplet, and I thought that was a really cool form. I think that was. Um, was that Christine Christine Potter? I think she's on. She joins these. Uh, I think that was hers. It was the Darjeeling Make Mine Darjeeling? I think it's called from issue thirty-two. So I like that one. We've done a few others that are really cool. There's a guy Paul Siegel who does these really intricate, complicated shape poems. But uh, but and so we published a few of his. We've published a few over the years. There's a really cool one in uh, the Young Poets issue where it's like a tower and and there's a whole point. You have to read it up, which is kind of cool. So you climb up the tower of the poem. So you could do cool things with it, but my problem usually is that it's a distraction because I like the, I like the escape into someone else's mind or something, you know. It, poetry and meditation, it's it's like a secular meditation prayer kind of thing for me. So for me personally, I'm not a fan of anything that distracts from the voice and the music of the, of the poem, because that makes me remember that I'm doing a poem and I don't get that same meditative connection to it. Um. Let's see. I got to get going soon, but um, yeah, I should get going soon. But let me do one more. So Cam Wheeler says, does the notion of writing toward an audience 
and even toward publishing relate to the discussion you had with about insta poetry in the first rattlecast with Ben Elshar. Yeah, yeah, good. Rem- yeah, uh, way to remember that, uh, Ken Wheeler. Yeah, I think exactly. I think that's the main difference between insta, insta poetry and uh, what we call poetry. Um, I think that um, insta poetry is written for an audience, and, and when you're writing for an audience, you want um, you kind of want it to be vague enough that, that it's a, a, a bowl that they can fill with their own stuff. And, and it's not about the idiosyncrasies of the author, because uh, that, that is something you should just flush down the toilet if you're writing for an audience, because only certain people will connect with certain poems and images and ideas. And, um, and you kind of have to risk that to make something new. And I think the Insta poetry, just for the way, it's not that the, those poets um, can't do it like that. They're just not trying to do it like that. They're trying to write things that are relatable to as many people as possible, which is why they do relate to as many people as possible. But you can't make something new and relate to as many people as possible at the same time, because newness will not relate to, to you know, people will not relate to it. They will not enjoy it. And I think there's a large portion of the population that, that will resist it. I think in, in one of the interviews I use this metaphor, but I think um, um, there's a way that that the newness, the, the creativity, that the creating order out of the chaos of human experience or the raising the resolution of, of human experience and finding those interstices between the things we understand. I think some people experience that in the same way, like an adrenaline rush kind of. It's like a, like a mental adrenaline rush. And the idea of this new thought being added to your brain is like a little bit of like a little high. And we kind of get addicted to it. And that's why we love poetry. And, and when I say poetry, I mean the poetry that we, as this audience here and myself, you know, are drawn toward. Um, but, but the majority of the population, I think, doesn't feel that. They, they feel that as cognitive dissonance because it's their worldview shifting around in a way that's un, uncomfortable. In the same way that most of us wouldn't want to jump out of an airplane, but some people love jumping out of an airplane. So, um, so I think that um, you can't write... You know, you can't write th- that way and make newness at the same... It, they're just not the same thing. And they're different, they're different efforts for different reasons. And, and I think poetry, as we mean poetry, will never... has no chance of being popular in the same way Instagram poetry is because they're just not the same thing. And, and it, it's not even about the, the... Like I talked, I think, with Richard about this maybe, but Richard Gilbert. But, um, you know, haiku will never be popular on Instagram. It's not the, it's not the brevity or the images or the, the feeling about it. Um, it's that, you know, haiku is the exact opposite of what Instagram poetry is trying to do too. Um, anyway, I do have to run. Let's see. Um, yeah, I just have to go. So maybe we'll do, this was kind of fun. Maybe we'll do a Q&A type thing some other time in a couple months or something too. But next week we'll get back to our regular critique of the week. Uh, we have Mary Tora Grossa, who's actually coming to our literary festival this week. Um, but we'll do a poem of hers on Friday next week. Um, and let's see. And this week coming up on the Rattlecast, Jamie Hecht, uh, plus an open mic as always. Uh, Jamie Hecht, uh, speaking of formal poetry, he's a formalist. He's one of those. He had two sonnets in the, uh, in the current issue of Rattle. And his book, Dodo Feathers, is mostly blank verse, I, th- I would say, having flipped through it. Um, and he's, he's really, I think I said in the, you know, earlier this week that he's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He's sort of a genius. And, uh, and his poems are great. And there's a lot to talk about. He's a psychotherapist, too. So tune in uh, on Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Pacific. And uh, we'll see Jamie Hecht. But in the meantime, hope you have a great week. And I'll be at the Wrightwood Literary Festival weekend. So I'm going to be exhausted, but, but having a lot of fun. I wish you could come if you can't, but uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a good weekend. Bye.